Hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture, which is the penultimate session in this term's new models lecture series. The series, which began last autumn, has invited architects and other interdisciplinary practitioners to discuss how their work can change the models around which society is organized. Each event proposes a new model to address how we can shift power structures, socioeconomic forces, and structural inequalities present in society today to give us new tools to rethink the world around us. Over the past year, a series of new models have been presented to underline the need to redesign institutions, redress who has access to funding, reverse the lack of representation in public art, embrace physical and digital spaces of collective care and mutuality, find new forms of community-led practice, invent new forms of recognition, discuss new ways to excavate the past in order to deal with conflict in our present, and address the interconnected and intersectional crises threatening the future of our planet, with more to come in the year ahead. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manisha Vergis, and I'm the head of the AS Public Program. And I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, who through her practice that spans architecture, urbanism, and advocacy, has developed a consistent methodology for every project that she works on, focusing on the voice of the user and engaging them in the strategic process in a deep and meaningful way. Stephanie Edwards is an architect and urbanist. Stephanie graduated from the AA in 2010 and worked at OMA before establishing Urban Symbiotics with James Stewart in 2018. She's currently working on a range of regeneration frameworks, district center and high street visions, meanwhile spaces, institutions and community buildings. Tonight, she'll present a new model for user-focused design, discussing the approach that she and her product designer partner um, in the business, James Stewart, have developed through their practice and an array of projects that have been born out of a singular multidisciplinary and user-centric process that is applied across all their projects, whether they are urban design, architecture, or placemaking, or sometimes a combination of those things. Every project explores the use of insight to inform and innovate design. Too often users are frustrated by the consultation process that is either a superficial conversation or just a box checking exercise without their words and time having an impact on the resulting project. Instead, taking inspiration from the world of product design, where the user is placed at the center of design decisions, the team engages with community members and stakeholders when formulating the brief and seeks their insight in identifying their needs, continuing to engage them to help develop concepts and validate solutions. So before I hand over to Stephanie, a few notes on the format. Um, she'll give her lecture and following that, I'll ask a few initial questions before opening it up to you as the audience for a wider discussion. Um, feel free to post your questions in the chat at any point, and I can either ask them on your behalf or if you feel comfortable to do so, um, use the raise hand function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I can unmute you so you, you can ask your question. And um, during the discussion, especially if you don't mind turning your camera on, that would be amazing. So at least we can feel like we're all in the same room, despite the series still being held online. So I'm really just delighted to have Stephanie join us tonight for this talk and as part of this series as both a friend and an inspiring role model who has made space for a very different type of practice that is much needed by the discipline. So please join me, join me in welcoming her back to the AA. Oh, thank you, Manajay. What a lovely, lovely introduction. Um, thank you. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here and um, I couldn't um, really want for a better Thursday evening um, looking at you Manajay today but thank you and um, thanks for inviting me to talk about this. Um, so yes so as, as you said Manajay my name is Stephanie Edwards and I'm one of the co-founders of Urban Symbiotics and I'm really excited to be talking to you about this new model for user-focused design and I'd really like today to talk about this approach because I think you know with the last two years that we've had why you know we really do need to be talking about this user-centered approach and, and the, the actual approach. Um, I will touch on some aspects of design, but I'd really like to talk about um, the approach. Um, and I'm going to do that across a few projects. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about an institution, an estate, a high street, um, and, and some meanwhile space. Um, but before we start, I'll just talk a bit about you know who, who we are. So essentially. Um, urban Symbiotics was founded by myself. Um, I'm an architect and urban designer um, and James Stewart, a product designer. And together we came together to start to look at um, creating this design agency that really started to specialise in delivering um, innovative placemaking through an insight based process. And we're really trying to look at this approach of this culmination of product design principles um, coupled with urban design, architecture and placemaking processes. 
um, and looking to create this, this unique innovative approach whilst it, it's used in product design and um, less so used within the built environment. Um, so in terms of the standard approach, you know, what, what are we looking at a new model against? So um, in most processes, this, this diagram shows a standard relationship between engagement and design um, in an urban design or architecture development program. And it just shows the priority is the design with a small amount of engagement or larger in some senses. And here, right in the center, you can see the small amount of insight or focused insight um, used to inform that design process. So um, instead, we try and look at giving equal weight to understanding the user, their needs, their concerns and aspirations, as we do to designing a solution to address them, um, as you can see from this image here. And similarly, um, instead of just engaging and really looking at research of the people that are using these spaces, the users at specific points, once the design process has already started, we, um, we instead we promote this continuous engagement process that sees the, the user contribute across the whole program. Um, so by the solution is launched, it has been developed and validated with the user. And we'll also talk a bit later about how they can take it forward um, themselves. But then looking a bit more into depth about our process, um, we're really trying to look at how do we start to develop this um, with this new model? Like we really start from an analysis. So analyzing the demographics of an area, looking at who's in the area, how old they are, ethnicities, and um, all different aspects, like and stakeholder mapping, finding out where they are, barriers um, to participate, where, why they may usually be involved in these processes or not. And then we start to strategize. How can we find unique engagement or research techniques to look at this iterative process in order to really gain that insight that then we can use to start to co-create um, and innovate? Um, and then moving on to this idea of co-owning, giving a sense of ownership across to those who are using it. As designers, we can design a space, but essentially it's not us who will be using it. So how can we put that into the process? And moving that on to the validation and celebration stage, where instead of that being a point of this area of like a planning submission, um, it's where you're actually validating it with those people that you spoke to right at the beginning or, you know, use research from. And so it's actually a point of celebration um, where people can take forward the design themselves and then onto championing, um, which we then go into using and operating. And then what's really important is this feedback loop. Um, and how we can continue this symbiotic relationship. But also what's just as important is that development of pride and ownership of place from the users, from the operators, and those who essentially make a place happen. So um, I'll go on to talk about a few projects. Um, I said I'll talk about very slightly onto an institution, a high street, um, and a space. So going on to 21st century estate, so we worked with the Royal Institute of British Architects as part of their schools programme. And we worked with 13 to 15 year old children at Hammersmith Academy to really understand and develop a 21st century future estate. And we did so by going through a process of insight gathering to develop place and areas that they'd like to see. And um, so we spoke to them, we did like in-depth interviews and we started to ask them, you know, how do you start to um, understand your sense of place, like how do you use your areas? Um, what does your neighbourhood mean to you? How far does it stretch? How far does it, you know, contract? What's your idea of your environment and your vision for it? And it was quite interesting. So we worked with them to start to build, you know, those like days in the life and, and spaces and trying to really understand their experience of their environments. We really started to understand that they had this limited sense of belonging they had a limited sense of agency over their spaces by asking them alone. Um, we also measured their increased empowerment as we were asking them, just having pride by people actually asking them. Um, but then we also started to, started to look at um, what spaces were welcoming to then. And what was really, I guess, disturbing in this sense is that a lot of the areas that have been designed for them by architects, landscape architects, were essentially places of threat or places of threat. And what was interesting about this is that we discovered that some of the, the most dangerous areas were any open spaces and parks that were available to them. So as designers and urban designers were told to create neighbourhood parks for 
to teenagers, for those who are 13 to 15 year olds. And so we continue to do some re a research piece across several schools across London. And actually over 90% of young people spoke to us about all outside spaces being dangerous. So what are we also not considering? And what are we inadvertent? And are we inadvertently designing young people out of the spaces? So um, this is a slide actually taken from Carleen Thurman. Um, she is a social researcher. And it's really interesting that we tend to focus on if there is a problem with a child, you focus on the home as being an issue and it's about the parents. But from this diagram, you can clearly see that actually the neighbourhood is the biggest reach and that's beyond schools and your peer group. So how are we as designers ensuring that we are creating places that are not only inclusive, but are safe, safe for people to, to actually use? So some of the things we spoke to them about were, you know, having spaces to belong, um, a valid place to hang out, a place to express themselves without suspicion, and also for technology to be used more effectively. Um, so as creators and designers of spaces, it's becoming increasingly clear that we need to revise our approach. So I'd like to continue this on to what if we flip the script? Um, so moving on to a project that actually um, collaborated also with um, Manage on. And this is also working on a project led by um, Beyond the Box, the People's Pavilion. What if a world was co-designed with young people? So this started with um, laying the foundation. Um, they work a lot with peer-to-peer -peer groups, um, with Beyond the Box working with um, getting young people to debate with other young people. You know, we don't always need to be in those spaces. Having roundtables, engagement, street in interviews, podcasts and poetry. But then also capacity exchange. We also talk about capacity building, but what does it mean for us to actually learn from young people? Um, we might teach them about design principles, about engineering, communicate, communicating. But what can we learn as designers too? What, how can we capacity exchange? So we also um, collaborated with them to look at this four-day process of really working to co-design with young people, the same age range between 15 to um, just over 18 from immersion to development to validation and, and to finalise through the final pavilion build. But through this, we went through mentorship and guidance over this. It was an intense four-day process. We developed their skills. We looked at this capacity exchange, them telling us about what spaces they needed to see, their validation, also to finalising through this confidence building as well as actually using a space. So this is the, the group of young people at the beginning of the four-day process. And it was a group of um, six teams. We worked with them um, to develop their ideas, develop their insights. How do you create a space of belonging? How do you take up space? How do you ensure your voice is heard? And we developed that alongside other architects with a curator curatorial team. We had um, cultural curators. But I'd like to talk about this, these, these twins who grew up in Newham. And what was really amazing about them is that they grew up, they were 10 years old when the Olympics happened and they had such a positive effect on, on, on something that was seen to seen as a legacy to us, but actually started to build their confidence as designers and, and have power over the space that, that they lived in, they had pride. But this was their pavilion. It was a place of flexible expression. But I'd like to talk about this because they spoke about merging their social references of growing up in Newham how to create a community structure, but from a young person's perspective, a flexible experience, a space for all ages and an accessible space. But what does that mean? You know, we talk about movable furniture. It sounds really, really simple, but something that's flexible and movable, but also where young people have the agency to create their own space in a really simple way. A range of amphitheater seating so that you could come together, but have your own space and a space to care. But it's also just as important to express an identity. They spoke about the, you know, having this beacon of multicolored lights showed diversity, a symbol of storytelling and unity where they actually fit. But really across all of the pavilions, there was this sense of flexible spaces, observational spaces, spaces that reflected identity of young people, spaces that do not exist in the city that we live. The key insights for us as design teams became spaces to enable reflections, spaces to, um, that created a welcoming space. What does that mean? But also helping to build soft skills and capacity exchange beyond that capacity building and a multidisciplinary response. 
And this is the final pavilion, truly a place of flexible expression, a place where a number of programme and events could happen that was available to be used all um, during the night and during the day, a place for exhibition, a place where they could start to showcase some of their great designs, but also invite people into the space that they had created for themselves. Spaces for art, spaces for spaces for um, for different types of users. They had pride events, they had drawing events, young people's events, they had carnival events. So, what is this user centered approach? Is it design or is it program? Is it curation or is it design? Again, this is Space Black who took over the area, who started to create an immersive experience of looking at expression within a space. You know, this is looking at you know, visually representing people and histories. This is also another way of taking up space. But then how can we start to look at this and bring this into our day to day? How do we as designers use this? This is an example of um, a diagram used for a, for a master plan in Milton Keynes, a place called Walton Manor. It's separated, it's a new residential area, an area that has open space, residential employment, People are always talking about us and them, talking about play to actually bring people together. But this is starting to look at what if we started to bring users into the design? What if we started to bring in like residential and open space, but creating spaces of flex for young people or different communities to program? What if when we're designing, we're creating places for flex, not just for play? What does flex mean? Does flex mean a policy decision? Does that also mean that we need to start looking at different structures of a user-focused design rather than just master planning with, you know, sketches and, and examples of the future that we exist with, we may imagine without bringing people, you know, to the front table. So moving on to an estate, we set up a, a forum called the Gascoigne Residence Forum. This is in Barking and Dagenham, a place that actually had hardly any um, engagement within its estate. It has like a, a high proportion of, of Muslims, it has a hyper, like a you know smaller proportions of Christians, there has like almost half and half, less slightly more males, um, and a real mix of ethnicities. And we use this demographic analysis of an area to create the Gascoigne Residence Forum. So this is blurry intentionally of um, the forum members, and he really reflected those people. It's not a residence um, group that you'd usually have of just a particular age, but really looking at those who wouldn't normally be involved in the process, bringing them together to shape the estate renewal. So we looked at, this was during COVID, and so we worked with them to co-design spaces. We asked them, how do you use spaces? What aspects of parks and public spaces do you use in the estate? You know, how can you how can you help other people be less reliant in cars as opposed to just taking that away? How can you create a place and an existing estate feel like home where you may have just bad experiences about them? So we really looked at in-depth um, conversation and a research piece as to how we could start to facilitate the, the, these insights into the design moving forward. And it was interesting because we're always focusing on spaces for adult for for. We always focused on spaces for young people, but during the time, how are we designing spaces for adults? How are we designing spaces for groups to gather together? How are we reducing the noise of children's areas, particularly when we're all during lockdown areas? How do we create a sense of community, an area for arts, um, both outdoors and indoors, and places to actually vis visibly reduce crime and opportunities for residents? So again, we continue to start developing, but we actually started to look at how this could come together in a space. We looked at how to make a, a place through um, cooking you up their favourite meal. So, you know, talking about place making in a different way. What's your protein? You know, maybe that's about the type of space. What's your spice? That was a really interesting question to some people. How do you actually start to place make with people? What's your method? How do you create different places from the same ingredients? Um, but actually bringing people into conversations they wouldn't usually be involved in. So this is the creation of a meanwhile space, working with Fabric, um, and we worked with um, the forum to start to look at their insights, to develop this space of art, places for adults, places for people to come together, places of contemplation and well-being. And this is how it came together. This was one of the, the opening days of how a space that is in flux, flux can start to bring meaningful ownership over, over a space. 
how you can also create a space for play, how you can start to create places for, you know, birthday parties and bringing insights into, you know, allowing people to use and own spaces. Also, you know, for younger people to really take up space. So we also had harvest put into this area, but also started to look at this real insight, bringing this insight, it is directly responded to the resident needs, the resident design, and also resident programming. And they came together to start every, every month, they now come together to create these spaces in London of all places. And again, they've now created their own Gasco and Residence Forum where they come together as a group and we step away as designers to enable them to design their own spaces and their own programme. And again, just moving on to ensure that these are, I mean, they look like bouncers, but they are nice people. Um, but then this is a really interesting quote because they spoke about speaking as a resident. All we've had is pawn brokers, gambling shops, chicken and chip shops and pound shops. We are worth more than this. So fantastic what you, the community and faith groups and the council are doing to change this. Thank you for arranging this workshop and listening to us. And that was without even the design itself. This was just in the workshop that actually started to ensure that people's voices are heard and that, that pride is actually brought back and that they're, as I said, worth more than just gambling and chicken shops. So the Black Cultural Archives, this is a program, a pro, pro, it's a project as an institution that we're working on now. This is, I'm going to talk about process and testing. I'm not going to reveal like our final designs, but it's really about how do you look at an institution that's called the Black Cultural Archives um, but starts to create a place that is for the Black history, a national place of Black history. So it is um, within Brixton. It's tucked away slightly, just um, connected to Windrush Square. But it is um, it's quite well connected, but it is quite hidden away. So what does that mean for people? We spoke to those bringing, um, bringing activities into the space, those who are cooking in the space. We spoke to the, um, to the staff, what works, what doesn't. We were first brought on to look at a kitchen, but we said to them, let's find out what you really need, what works, what doesn't work, and let's go through focus groups with you to really understand um, how an institution can work for its community, can work for those wider, and also those within the area itself. So we actually did a roadshow of a lot of people um, across the UK. This one looks at like um, national sports, sporting black heroes and but we also had one on younger people. We also spoke to community groups and spoke about what does the Black Cultural Archives mean to them and how can you facilitate a larger process of engagement and insight into a place that is supposed to reflect and hold Black history. Aspects where it doesn't feel like it's a place for Black people or the community. It doesn't feel like their gates are open. It doesn't feel as if um, it doesn't, Explain, it doesn't explain, it doesn't share its history, but it does. But as a building, as an experience, it does not. And um, so we started to look at what are your points? What are your touch points? Um, the gate, this looks, shows that it's open, but actually most of the time it's closed, almost a barrier to the community of Brixton. We have these, these open windows that are actually completely, um, they're completely boarded up and closed. We have about six different doors and no one actually knows the entrance. And it's within this historic building, a Georgian building that was two homes that doesn't outwardly or actually within the interior reflect Black British history. So we started to look at what does it mean to occupy it? We started looking at testing during COVID, bringing the entrance actually out to the front, creating a more welcoming entrance by opening up the courtyard, creating tropical planting that's also native, <laughs> um, not just using... Um, for example, um, not just using those like silver birches that would essentially go with a space that actually started to create barriers for people to come into. We worked with people and the community to actually develop these spaces. We brought planting in. How can you start to own and develop a space that is a courtyard? How can you create a space that is an entrance? Started to create, how do you create a welcome, a welcome during COVID? a space where people can actually come together and feel safe, but also feel within a space that reflects your identity. We did this through testing, we did this through wayfinding. We also started to look at how can the BCA, the Black Cultural Archives, use its, its facades? How can it create that welcome from the outside to the inside? Looking at the Chicago movement um, within America where they looked at actually putting archive material and actually art 
and histories on the external aspects of the war, starting to explain how black history could be solved from that external war. How can we bring that now using projectors, opening up what's happening inside and actually getting people involved and interested in a space without actually having to traverse those doors? And actually starting, we're now looking at testing how histories are made. Archives is not just about holding histories, but how can you actually start to have a living room? We're creating this living room where we can make histories. We're having a podcast room where you can start to develop it. And we're starting to test these as we speak, and this is um, starting to happen now. But it's looking at how do you put the user front and, front and centre? First, you need to get them through the door. How do you then get them to actually interact in a space? But we'll, look, we'll be looking at the West Indian living room. We'll be looking at We'll be looking at um, historic areas for those who were involved in, in, for example, activism. How did the BCA start? And then finally, looking at the Pearly Strategic Framework, this looks at a high street. Um, we started with um, a very adverse um, community who are against all development. But again, we worked with that demographic analysis. How can we start with who do we need to engage and how do we engage with them? We, set, we created a pearly panel, um, again, very diverse and representative, worked about how to build in a community within a high street, how to build a community within a district centre, getting younger people to involve with younger people through different models of retail and building infrastructure as we build new buildings. It's a complete suburban area that's being, um, that has high intensification and actually it's looking at how do you actually enable people to feel like development is actually um, benefiting themselves. So we started with the Pearly panel and um, Pearly needs your ideas. We're now funded by the Mayor of London um, as one of the exemplar high streets and um, working together with the Pearly panel who are now taking forward this demographic representative there to take forward their ideas for the um, high street. How can we as designers facilitate people to take ownership of their space and develop that? We started, we looked at festivals, food festivals, markets, blackboards, bringing people's interest and insights into space. You know, using actually, we start to be developing the multi-story car park and how we can start to activate that as space. What would you do to to create a program event of Pearly Sundays? And then also ensuring that social media is also building this digital idea of a high street. How can you start to look at that digital programming of a high street that also works and encourages people to come to a space? Looks at promoting, looks at changing a place that was an area that you pass through to a place that you come through. Um, this looks at insight analysis. We started with, you know, instead of mapping an area of mapping an area of like, where are your green spaces? Where are your movement? Where are the places that, you know, that you come together? Where are the places that don't work? Where are you fly tipping? Where, what areas are safe? Which areas would you like to extend? Using insights to then translate into a strategy, a strategy that can be taken forward into small projects and um, projects that can be taken forward by the community through this insight stage. And then so it came through to the development of how do you create a high street as a hub? These start to look at insights of gathering places for intergenerational use, creating library of thoughts and intergenerations coming together, a digital high street, a high street that uses its old Sainsbury sites, sites and multi-story to bring young people together, a place that brings this high street as a hub. We started to look at a thoroughfare that's mainly used as main, one main um, just really just a road into a place that's a showcase how can people that go through tend to come back how can you create a public welcome but actually look at a high street almost as a billboard space um, and also start to create places of wonder and discovery or a station as a catalyst how can we start to use stations um, and places of you know modal change and transport but actually a place where communities come together a place where um, you can actually start to build on that community. So young, older people can look after those who are leaving their children or the, the children of those who are commuting and that stations should actually start to work harder and, and provide new different types of models of space and abandon spaces as inspiration. How do you use those alleyways to turn them into laneways and areas where you come that are spaces you can come together as opposed to um, being separated or isolated and the parks as a community centre a flexible space that can have the people's pavilion for example that can have festivals and events but also changing policy to enable that to happen and to enable new areas so essentially 
the user focus output, what is that? And you'll see I've spoken most of it about approach, but how people can actually take agency over those spaces and how as designers, we don't always have to be those who are designing instantly without actually informing people, bringing people in place. Really, if we're starting to create these areas of um, user focus output, what, what is that? You know, is it a, a meeting of people, place and activity? And how do we start to facilitate that? Um, thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was, I mean, a, a huge amount of work that you covered in, in very, very quickly. Um, and I think a really unique approach to practice. And I thought that first diagram that you showed us with that tiny sliver of how much user engagement is in a typical project versus how you kind of expanded that in your practice was really um, like, I mean, although I kind of was aware that people have consultation fatigue and so many communities feel like when they're engaged in a process, it's at a very superficial level, just seeing that kind of proportion in your diagram um, just really drove the point home. And I was curious from your work and practice prior to setting up Urban Symbiotics, um, like how that became the kind of, uh, I, I, I guess, the strategy for, for you and James in, in your practice from its name onwards, I guess. In terms of the work that was done beforehand, is that what you? That yeah, what like how your your experience and practice maybe led you in a direction to kind of make this the focus of your strategy, um, of yeah. your own practice. No, I think it's really, 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 really interesting point. Um, I think it's really interesting because you have um, Carlos, who's on the call, and obviously I was in his unit, and we we're focusing on people all the time <laughs> and city strategies. Um, but then when I went into practice, working on different areas, we would. And they were designing big master plans, like really large, like urban, I remember we did an urban extension, for example, of over 5,000 new homes in, um, in Luton. And we came to the engagement process and we're talking to, you know, communities that use the spaces. It was quite a deprived area. And we we're extending like to like create free new town centres, residential area. But actually, when it came to that insight that we gained right before we we're about to enter, you know, submit to planning, there were very clear decisions that we could have made earlier on by enabling some of the community to come together better, having better connections between, between the older community, the existing community and new communities and insights that essentially just would have made the place better. It would have enabled um, that future of that development um, just to have, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's extreme, a brighter future, I would say, or just using some of the energy that already existed to bring communities together and, and provide them with the spaces that were needed within such a large master plan. We talk about social value now, but all we needed was to talk to people earlier on and bring that insight into the development of, you know, a master plan, whether it's through different types of district centres that had different types of, for example, focuses or had, you know, facilitated just some of the... Um, the facilities and the uses that were already happening or that were lacking in a way that you can't tell from plans and that you can't t tell from just like, you know, spatial exercises. And I think it was, you know, also working with James from a product design perspective where, you know, we'd go to consultation events and you would only see, for example, those who are over 65 or, you know, those who really had the time and, and energy to, to commit, but you, you didn't have those who rented or you didn't have younger people and you didn't have, you didn't have you know you didn't have children you didn't didn't have a good like you know ethnic mix and you just thought well you're engaging but you're engaging with such a small proportion of society how can we be designing designing like that you know what are we missing out but also um we're really starting to do a disservice to creating spaces for you know a, a real future yeah i mean i guess you touched on this with the pearly project about how you went into that project with the community that didn't really want to engage. And I was curious as to how you got them to engage. And like when you go to these consultations and they're the kind of people who would typically come to these things and speak, how do you get the people that aren't there or don't have time to engage to be part of the process? And like, what are maybe tools or strategies that you used, not just in Pearly, but in across the projects that have worked to get young people, to get renters, to get, um, people from different ethnic backgrounds just so that the conversation is really shaped by everyone rather than just the ones that have the time or are comfortable to speak in a public forum? Um, I think for us, um, I think that's why it's really important to let 
demographic analysis stage and really understand who is in this community or who may be in the future community, but understanding that and trying to work out how we can go to them. Um, so for example, we went to, we're doing a community vision for Dagenham Heathway. And so we went to their, you know, they had a whole Santa's Grotto that was set up in their shopping mall. So we went there last week, you know, then you're going to them. You know, we provided like, you know, this big Christmas tree that completely, you know, all of the young people and families added all of their baubles to this Christmas tree is that, you know, what they wanted for their future. And it's how do you, make, you know, we tried to make it accessible. We tried to make it interesting. We go to people so they don't have to come out of their way um, just to ensure that and it also shows that you care, that they want to be heard. Um, but I think it's really important that we don't just set up in a town hall and put you know, some easels up and expect people to come to us because a lot of people don't have time, they don't have the resources, they don't feel like their voice matters. Um, and so we'll really just ensure that once we have that demographic, we'll strategize an engagement program to go to the different people, whether it's we're going to schools or, you know, we're going to a big Christmas market in Norfolk tomorrow um, or on Saturday, sorry, um, because we know that there's going to be a lot of people there. Like, how can we also be in places where people people are um, as we really try and do that. Yeah, I think I think that's incredible. Um, I I think using the the Christmas market as like a form of engagement that's actually fun, as opposed to the town hall meeting with easels and plans that no one can really read or understand. Um, is a really brilliant strategy. And Carlos doesn't really know this, but one of my one of the most memorable projects I remember seeing in his unit was someone who dressed up as Santa and went to different economic or people from different economic areas um, and gauged their reaction as a way to kind of ha- start a conversation around around space. And I just thought um, maybe people don't realize that Christmas is a very useful strategic tool <laughs> to, to get people to start talking to you. Um, but I guess I can keep asking you questions all evening, but just as a reminder to everyone in the audience to please also ask questions, either raise your hand and I'll unmute you so you can be part of the conversation or post them in the chat and I can ask it on your behalf. But in the meantime, I'll ask you another question, um, which is, I think speed is really interesting because you talked about taking the time to listen, but also not being too quick to, to intervene and actually having time to test things out. And I was wondering like how you build those relationships with clients, um, because I thought it was really great that with the Black Cultural Archives that you were really like starting to test out things almost as experiments rather than jumping into something that very expensive and permanent. And I think that's really important. But also, as you know, from our conversations leading up to this lecture, I'm really fascinated by how your conversation with the Black Cultural Archives started as like a kind of kitchen like a very small project, but then as the minute you started opening up that consultation, the project became a much bigger strategy and has led to it being like a really rich and and diverse kind of project of multiple strands. And so, yeah, I was just quite curious as to your relationship with clients and how how something small, a small engagement can become a kind of bigger kind of system or strategic project. Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting one. I, did, I didn't show, so we have like a, a master plan for the Black Cultural Archives that has, you know, different um, developments of different spaces. But I think what's what we really try to do is really try to understand what a client really needs and wants. And I think sometimes they, they might not know. For example, they wanted a kitchen because they wanted to have more footfall and they wanted to provide more food. But actually when we did the insight, it wasn't about people needing needing you know a kitchen for more food it was actually about bringing in and um, people to really experience the space like to experience what black history is experience being able to create your own black history or you know learn from other people but we really needed to understand what people's experience was of the space and their expectations first so I think in terms of us talking to clients we'll always almost use it as an engagement with the clients in the first instance how can we start to ask them you know what would you like to see? What are your aspirations? You know, where is your pain? Um, and how can we help you develop that? Um, I think we've been asked to do, you know, some engagement for, you know, an area in, um, in Barking and Dagenham, as I said. And we said, actually, you need a framework for development to continue. If we're going to ask people a lot of questions, how can we ensure that it can happen? Um, so how can we ensure that there's a strategy that fits with everything that you have? You know, you might start to look at an urban design strategy, but also... Um, you know business strategy how do you start to you know for example provide business um, 
business requirements and needs, but how does that overlap with, for example, your local plan and your urban design strategy? And also, you know, your bids for levelling up funds and your need to renew a, um, a shopping centre. How can you start to also work with the community to help them develop the space that they would like to see, which will then help you? So I guess we really try, you know, sit, workshop with the client in the first instance. What do you really need and how can we ensure that um, we can help deliver the best? Um, but we're also trying to create that symbiotic framework where if we step away, they still have enough insights to continue or, you know, a project list to actually start to develop from. That's amazing. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions? I can only see three of you. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'll keep asking you questions in the meantime. Um, I guess th there's something about like being an active listener. We had a, a new models uh, talk earlier, I think last last academic year, about a new model for listening by Samaya Valley, who designed the last Serpentine Pavilion. And she was talking about the role listening plays in her work in terms of listening to archives, listening to communities. And then how do you, how do you play a role in like, listening to things, but then also empowering people, but also translating some of that into projects. And I was curious as to how you saw your role as the kind of architect in this, um, in your practice, because there's a certain expertise that comes from being a designer, but then, you know, as you were saying, it's about like capacity building or learning, like how learning goes both ways and what do you learn from the people you engage with, but how do you empower them to be part of this? But then also like, where do you come in and what, where do you where do you kind of use your skills as the architect yeah no it's a really good question because I think I'm always very aware of you know trying to be like a bit ego less so you're not trying to impose but then also it's quite good to you know for example to challenge some of the like challenge you know some of the norms or things that people might not have thought about or how do you actually translate some of those insights into aspects that are interesting um like how, you know, for example, working on a high street, somebody might say, you know, I'd love to, you know, I can't get to the library. So I'd like the library to be closer. You know, do you need the library to be closer or can we start to look at different models of learning, different models of exchange? And I think it's, you know, we try to look at a multidisciplinary approach of not everything has to be built or not everything has to be architecture, but how can you start to build, you know, structures of, um, you know, policy structures or policy of engagement or policy, you know, looking at retail structures, for example, does a place always have to be a shop? How can you exchange? Can you start to exchange ideas? Like we're talking about, you know, the Rotary Club in Fairly, working with younger people so that older people can start to learn from younger people in terms of like tech skills, but then the younger people learning from some of the really great, you know, wealth of experience that some of the professionals have within within those groups. And so I think actually we're always trying to work out where should we be, where do we stand as designers? You know, should we just facilitate that, you know, ability um, for people to provide spaces for activity or, you know, to program their events within spaces? Or do we, you know, start to test out things by, you know, it, not imposing some design um, structures and saying, you know, how, how are you reacting and how are you also feeding back from these aspects too? Yeah, I guess on, on, on that note, um, Lara's posted a question in the chat, which is kind of wondering about form-based participation and having stakeholders make models themselves. And do you engage them in physical design and planning workshops in addition to the kind of design workshops that you've done with young people, like in the People's Pavilion, which is the example you showed? Yes, I guess the People's Pavilion was a very direct way of um, working with young people to help them design a space that they would like to see. Um, so we do use, yeah, those types of, we do use models to develop, but I guess what we're all saying, so that was a direct one with the People's Pavilion, you know, they worked over four days um, to develop their designs. So they worked, you know, with sketching and model making and, you know, with different architecture practices and us as like designers to work with how that model can be translated into something that can stand up, something that can be built. And, you know, some of that, them were able to, to build that space themselves. And I think there's also a real joy in that, people seeing something they've built with their own hands manifest. The two, you know, young women who actually 
built the final pavilion. I mean, the joy in their faces, I, you can't really express how that feels for, for young people who also a lot of the time feel as if they shouldn't be in space. So for them to actually start to build something that, you know, they see um, with their own eyes being used by other people is, is yeah, it's really, it's really empowering for them. Um, but it's, yeah, we also like to use insight, knowing that people might not know how they'd like to build a place or how can you go a bit deeper and ask those questions um, that they might not know about and how can we co-design together? So whether that's through drawing, whether that's through model making or actually co-designing building, for example, the park itself, which we did within um, the Gascoigne estate. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I guess, Stephanie and I haven't got to work on many things together, but there's so much overlap in what we're interested in. And it was very generous of her to say that I worked on this project too, because she was involved in a much bigger way. Um, whereas we were just kind of working with the cultural producers because the way the project was set up was that there were young people who did design workshops to design the pavilion, but also to program it. But um, I'm really glad we talked about the twins, but even the eventual winners, like they were such powerhouses. Like at the, there was like a kind of public vote to decide which pavilion would be built. And everyone had like models and, and boards of their designs and people had to go around and vote on them. And like the young people were super enterprising and they were like grabbing you as you walk past to give you their pitch. Or like the twins like told us about all about how being a twin had like shaped their experience of, of architecture and the built environment and, the, and their design for the pavilion. And someone's mom even <laughs> was trying to convince people <laughs> who to vote for. I think the winning project, like I think their mom played a big role in like <laughs> also <laughs> convincing people on the value of their design. So it was really like um, just really impressive to see how much those workshops had empowered them to really advocate for their ideas in a yeah. really big way. Um, mm -hmm. There's like loads of questions now in the chat. Um, if any of you would like to ask them yourselves, let me know, because I'm, I'm happy to to unmute you and, and not talk. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll just go down one by one. Um, Ella has said very impressive work and has thanked you, but, and has asked if you're inspired specifically by some ethnographic work or methods that you've applied in the field or in working with the community. Well, that's quite an interesting question, actually. Um, it's quite, so we did quite a bit of um, research just in terms of like what type of research to be using in terms of, you know, ethnographic research. How do you, and I think that's where we try to, um, the question before is like, how do you build models, but how do you actually dig down into insight? So I guess also starting to look at those themes. Um, so some of the work we looked at, I think in our earlier stages, we worked with students um, on a student dorm. And it was very much, how do you use those insights to come up with themes to create development. So one we're looking at in terms of a student dorm. Um, and it, we started to understand that people, you know, young people wanted a place where they could have almost this supported independence, this home away from home, having sustainability as a core aspect um, of their, um, of the way that they live. And, um, but they wanted to see how they affected it. So for example, like that identity coming first, that being through branding, um, as well as design and so really I guess in terms of that I'd question about ethnographics like we would be using those some of research techniques to understand those larger themes those larger aspirations beyond um, and inclusive um, of design and that shaping that shaping of space um, but yeah I think that's to answer that question. Yeah, I think that's that, that sounds really fascinating. Um, there's also lots of lovely comments for you in the chat, so I'll, I'll download it and send it to you as well afterwards. But um, the next question, um, and I see Carlos's hand raised, but I'll just ask this next question and then pass it over to him, um, is by Kuyen. Sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Um, and it's to say, what, what would your advice be to someone who works within a local council where people have a set way of working and a very tick box way of doing consultation and engagement? to start try trying to change things from within, which I think is a really great question because it can be quite hard to disrupt some of these more bureaucratic systems. Yeah, that is a, that is a, that's a really good question. I mean, um, I guess I have an, a question, an answer to that is that um, you can do the same amount of engagement that you have to statutory, like do in a statutory way, in the way that you, you must engage as a, as a local council, but you can, instead of holding it for example on, in a town hall you can hold it somewhere else so I think maybe you just start with 
smaller, smaller aspects. I think the problem I found that where people are against, for example, engagement and working with communities, that they have this fear. They have this fear of, you know, creating powerhouses or a fear that they're just going to be upset, a fear that, you know, the angry resident who won't like anything. And as, as soon as we get, you know, get it over and done with, the better for us. But I think if you can almost start with, you know, maybe you just sh- you just place an engagement, for example, within a community centre, we hold it in a shopping centre. It doesn't take that much, you know, it doesn't take additional work. So if you can almost look at, you know, what, what are the issues that they're facing? Is it, is it because of the type of people? Then you could have an argument to say, well, let's go to a different type of person because then at least you'll have more of a wide ranging view because sometimes the, the loudest voice isn't necessarily representative. Um, and then just try different models, I'd say. Just start, I think I'll just try and start step by step. And what we found is if you bring people along the process, they can really start to see the benefits for themselves as to why it's important that we start to talk to you talk to as many people as possible, or at least um, have that representation across um, yeah, different demographics. So I would um, I'd start small, um, bring, bring your group along, those tick boxes along, and just almost keep chipping away um, would be my, would be my uh, advice. I think that's such great advice because I think sometimes people are just afraid to try new things until because they think that their method is the only thing that would work until they're exposed to something different. So, yeah, I think it's about how do you not only just bring like bring the community along with you in the project, but how do you also shift perspectives or maybe bring people on the client side along as well and maybe expand their horizons on what they might be able to achieve in a different way. Um Carlos, do you want to ask your question? Yep. Yes, uh, Stephanie, wonderful to see you. Thank you for a wonderful talk too. Um, the It's a strange question, but I've been uh, copy editing a text today about uh, community involvement in shanty towns, actually, in Latin America. And one of the interesting things there is that they uh, attempted not only to work with a community, but to train people in the community to be part of the design process. So that they were actually, you know, in a sense, agents within the design process, rather than being uh, someone who's consulted. Um, and obviously it's, it's a different thing because it has a political structure that allows that to happen. It was very successful when it was uh, self-generated it was incredibly unsuccessful when it was appointed, if you see what I mean. So it has to come from the community itself. But it's that idea of actually not just a, a, a constant consultation, but actually being part of the design process or the future transformation of their area. Is that something that you think is possible to do in terms of them being part of the design team? Yeah, I do, actually. I think it's really interesting, that example, because I think, you know, when you do look at places like shanty towns, it's it's really important to do well and it's really important to do right. And, you know, when you get things right and wrong, the impact is, is, is so much greater than even over here. And I think, yes, I think we definitely can. And I think that's the model we should, I mean, part of the design process and design team, why can't they be like a major stakeholder? You know, we have this idea of stakeholders and we must engage with them. They must be involved. But why? Why shouldn't the community be part of that or, you know, residents and businesses? And I think that's where we talk about capacity building and capacity exchange. Like, how can we start to get them to a particular level where they can actually meaningfully get involved in that design process? Um, You know, they might not be able to get, you know, right to the end, but within a team, why not? You always have junior members of the team or people that are learning and they'll have insight that other people never have. Um, and I think that's where we've um, working with the Pearly panel, for example, in Croydon. I mean, they are taking it forward um, with a vengeance. They have, you know, we have this young mom who's now the chair of the Pearly panel and we're all slightly scared. <laughs> she's just fantastic. Like, she's just brilliant. She's she's engaged with her almost over a thousand children by going to the schools herself, bringing pizzas because she's so invested because she lives there and her children live there. And she will be part of the design process because she now has that agency and she has that position to be part of that design process but also part of that change like strategic change as well how do you start to have a program of events for your high street how do you start to design 
you know, like an old Sainsbury site that can work for young people, older people. And I think, yeah, it's really important. And we also that, you know, that kind of manual of bringing people together, creating your perfect dish is like creating a place. We're trying to do that to get people involved in a, the design process in a way that doesn't feel um, like oppressive or feel like a barrier. It's, you know, if you ask someone, what's the spice? What makes your place like flavorful? It's a different way of thinking about what you like about place and what you don't. And I think I'm all, I'm all for it, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, th- I think it's very empowering, isn't it? To, to, because I think to be consulted or to be asked is, is obviously important, but to, to feel that maybe you have a say in the decision making, I think is a whole new gear, you know, of actually, obviously you're not going to be the only stakeholder making the decisions, but to not be just sort of consulted and then the decisions are made, but somehow to maintain a level uh, of kind of sort of um, engagement in the actual process itself, I think is something that uh, uh, I think could be fantastic if it's possible to set it up in a sense. Obviously, communities are not that simple and they have lots of politics and there's a lot of people, you know, who speak and people that don't speak and so on. So it's very different. But I think it's, it's, it'd be a fantastic thing to try and do and to maintain it to the very end. And it says, in a sense, to give a sense of responsibility to the community for whatever happens in the future rather than just simply a wish list, as it were. So I think yes. it's... No, I, I completely, completely agree with you. And I think just to add on to that, it's, um, you're right. It's about how does that continue and how does that evolve and how do you work with communities? Because as you say, that you know there is politics. But I think what's really interesting even about that Pearly example is that Croydon is now bankrupt. So this, this Pearly panel really now feel empowered because they're the only ones who can make a change. Like they can't actually wait for the council to make a change. They are getting funding you know, from the mayor and you know working to do it. And I... I think it's just so important, isn't it? You're right. Like a lot of the times people get asked their opinion and never hear back what happens anyway, whether it's used. And yeah, if we can find models and yeah, I'm very passionate you know, about them. Or we have to wait for someone else to do it. And I think that Carlos's point and your answer, like, you know, it's it's really amazing to hear that like the Pearly panel can do things that councils can't or that they're able to access funding that like Croydon hasn't been able to access. So it's really fascinating. Um, Natasha, I haven't forgotten about your question, but I'm going to Andy's question just because it's linked to what Carlos was talking about, about people who speak and people who don't, um, which is, uh, did you find using online digital tools in some way might have made um, those people who might usually remain silent more vocal? Or like, what are ways to engage people that maybe feel a bit uncomfortable in a kind of big public setting to be part of the process? And that's a question from Andy from Open Learners. Yeah, no, I, can, um, I think yeah, number one, yes. Um, online actually really did give us an opportunity to, um, yeah, to, to really bring people forward to say, you know, what do you think? But what we also um, made a point to do whenever we had workshops is, it, I mean, it does take time, but we called everyone individually um, so that we could understand, you could start to understand who are the louder voices, who are the ones who might need a bit of, you know, prompting so that they can also have those individual conversations too but we really found that online really made a massive difference we actually had groups now where we're doing online and offline and even the same people in the same situation are a lot more vocal when because you can come to them you know they know they're preparing so you know you're going around the group so they're able to respond um and then there and then other people understand that their voices are a lot louder when it's online, actually. So I think that people are a lot more aware. Um, so I think that that's really worked. And also, I think we we try not to use too much um, jargon. And um, so people feel quite included because we realise that a lot of people don't speak because they don't understand what you're saying. I remember we had there was a comment of like, you know, what do you think of your public realm? And they're like, public realm? What is that? What is that? I'm not answering that. You know, it's like because they don't understand what it means. Like. Why don't we talk about public space? It could be a park, it could be your street. And so we're also working to think about how we as architects and designers can just be a lot more straightforward and, you know, communicate easier um, and not, you know, we don't want people to feel like they're going into an academic space, um, but a space that really is a space that they can be involved in. That's great. 
Um, so the, uh, Natasha's question, which I think is a really important question, um, is about, um, she said that the level of work involved in such in-depth co-design must be huge, but she was wondering from a practical perspective whether that time and skill is covered by the client or whether it has to be partly pro bono. Um, so what we're trying to do now is just itemize everything. <laughs> so it's really clear what a client is getting and why we're charging for it. Um, but then we're also trying to also display the benefits of that. Um, but I think um, you know, Natasha, your question is really important because not everyone feel that value, especially if they know they can get away with two, like one session in a town hall. How do you um, actually start to um, define that? But I think what's really helping is the Social Value Act. They're starting to look at how are you bringing social value to your projects and you have to do that now by law. Um, people are being, you know, it, I think society is changing and they're expecting more from community engagement, expecting, expecting more people to be included. And actually what we found is some of the older people and older voices are demanding younger people's voices to be heard because they know that the future is for them and it's not, you know, it's for the younger generation, it's for their grandchildren and children. And so and we're almost working with the two, um, but it does take a lot of time and it does take a lot of evenings and weekends, but um, it's, we're also trying to balance that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's for the love. <laughs> no, we, we, you should price for it. There is value, there is value in it. And I think it's, it's about really for us communicating that value, because if you, also if you involve people earlier on, and they're less likely to be upset later on. So for example, again, going back to Pearly, we just had, when we um, published our regeneration framework, we, it's just limited comments because they've been involved from the beginning of the project. And that's what they're always worried about because that's when all of the, you know, the community forces come together when they, they just don't feel like they're heard. So if we, we're trying to constantly look at the value of engaging earlier, and I think the, the government white paper has now defined early engagement in the UK to happen um, at the very early stages. So now hopefully that will hopefully that will be mandated, but it's definitely going towards policy terms. Yeah, and I, I guess like there's I guess the more the longer you do this, maybe the more you know you can prove like look to examples that you've worked on previously to show the value that is added by like I guess engaging the community from early on in the process and like really um you know understanding the insight that they can provide into the process. So um and I think also like as you're saying like from the policy level it's also useful with the white papers but also and the GLA with the public welcome of the high street um, initiative, but um, the grants that they're giving to like exemplary high streets is really fa fascinating. I got to be part of one of those conversations and I was really so impressed by how um, all the different things people were doing, but also how it was creating a community where high streets across the city could learn from each other. So like one high street was like developing a teenage market and like everybody wanted to know how they had done that to encourage young people to be entrepreneurial. And they ended up just like taking over the session and teaching everyone how to set up a teenage market, which is great. Um, Stephanie, I feel like I've been grilling you for ages. So let me know if you're happy to take a few more questions. There's one more in the chat, which is, um, you mentioned working on an urban extension with lots of new housing. And from um, this person whose name is C. Johnson, their experience, large house builders are often very wary of community engagement, seeing it as something that slows the process down and throws up new problems. Um, did you manage to convince these more commercially conscious parties of the value of meaningful public engagement? And if so, how? Um, yeah, that one was quite interesting. Um, I guess the problem we had with that was the developer changed over time. So the first one we had um, knew um, the importance of bringing the community um, on board, or actually bringing them on board. Like they paid for a carnival in the area where they, you know, almost allowed the community to meet the team. I mean, in that respect, we actually we actually had people um, uh, trying to uh, destroy some of the some of the development. So it was in their favour to engage. It was actually in their favour to listen. Um, so that was a very clear value of if you're trying to engage with people, they won't try and disrupt your development as they're moving forward. But I think you're right. Sometimes um, it, it, it can be a hard conversation to um, to convince some house builders. 
sometimes they want to, you know, you can also start to look at that through their corporate, you know, responsibility. Sometimes it's about images that look good, but, you know, we also try to be aware of that because we're very aware of, we don't want to ask the community um, their thoughts and aspirations if a change isn't going to be made. Um, so again, um, we're also trying to look at what, what is the value for that developer? Um, how can they save time? So a lot of the time you can argue that you can save time during planning because you have um, less people objecting to your development because you've brought them on board. Um, it, even by enabling like meanwhile users at the same time, you know, starting to get people involved, like introduced to, I guess, again, it's like looking at public welcome. How do you start to knit communities together by bringing them together earlier on? It just, we, we're always trying to communicate that value to them, but it isn't always that easy. So we understand that there's some that we'll, that we'll work with and some that will just come on a bit later. Um, so we haven't completely got it down, but um, I think, yes, yeah, some do it well and just some, some do not. The problem is I think it's not mandated enough, so they don't have to. Um, so it's really about looking at those other values that they can gain from that process. Yeah, and then you have a question. No, I'll meet you. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Stephanie, so much. Um, I have a comment and a historian's question. Apologies for the latter. Uh, I was, as someone who's used the Black Cultural Archives, I very much took your point about the way it's very confusing when you sort of don't know what door to go in and you don't really know what the building's about. And that space in front of it can be not only sort of antiseptic, but quite bleak and, and mm. off-putting. I just love the way you, particular, the particular way that you use tropical plants to define the space, make it more intimate, but also to express um, cultural identity and so on. And the person sitting at the table looked <laughs> like she might want to stay there and not even go inside. <laughs> So I thought that was brilliant. And also bringing, you know, the, 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 your other ideas around the, the, the entrance front of the museum, which needs a lot of attention and help to get people in, or for those who are not going to go in, your idea about putting the images externally. I thought that was completely brilliant. Um, my, com my That's my comment. My question, and uh, you may not even wish to answer it, is um, as, as a member of the Matrix generation, I'd like to ask this question. What did you learn from their practice? Oh, interesting. Um, I mean, it's really interesting, I guess. Um, from the, I guess if we look at, you know, the Matrix generation, you've done so much and laid the ground. And I think what's really interesting to hear about the Matrix generation is that I don't know, it's almost like full circle, like people forgot a lot of the things that were done during that time and now we're coming back as if it's, you know, a new thing. I mean, I'm talking about a new model for user-focused design because not many people are doing it actually. Um, and so it's really nice and I think heartening to know that such great work was done, I guess, from the Matrix generation, but also before you know, if we look at female modernists, what they were doing during those times, I mean, we, we spoke about that, I think, over, probably two years ago now. Yeah. And there's such great work in the archives to see, to just see really great models of practice that um, I guess we need to keep alive, don't we, by keep telling the stories. We're telling the stories of um, how we can move forward and continue practice, but how can we also ensure all of this great work that was done before is built upon and not lost? Um, so that's that's my response. I think I'm, I'm in a lot of admiration as to what has happened, and if I can like shine a light and to continue any of that, that would be uh, just yeah, just complete joy for me. Yeah. Doing brilliantly. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's actually really lovely, kind of full circle because I think Stephanie, some of the first lectures you were part of in the public program were as part of the AAXX 100 project, which was celebrating the centenary of women at the AA, which Lynn co-curated with Elizabeth Darling. And um, you were so inspiring then as a kind of graduate of the AA um, and someone who was really trying to re like think about the profession, but also like who didn't serve. Um, and then I think you, you even participated in the final panel of our conference that like in the centenary year where we were looking to the future as to like what comes next. So it feels great to have you as part of this new models series. Um, and 
I think I was looking through the list of people we've had speak over the last year and a half. And actually, I think you're the first AA graduate. There was one other AA graduate who was part of like a bigger collective that spoke. But I think you're the first standalone speaker who is an AA graduate who's part of the series. And so I was just curious as to how maybe the AA shaped your attitude towards maybe questioning practice and um, seeking out new models Um and uh, yeah, I mean, as you just said, it's maybe a model that builds on a kind of longer legacy, but the fact that people aren't really operating in this way and you're questioning the kind of status quo as a way to change the way we practice. I was wondering like how much of that came from your experiences in practice and how much did your education at the AA maybe um, shape this approach? Yeah, no, really good question. And yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing me back. Um, I think actually a lot of the work um, that I didn't dip 10 to be honest really did steer me down that route of how do you start to change like practice like say for example um we're doing some work in Swaffham in Norfolk and it's a historic town and it's just filled with cars like it's absolutely filled with cars it's, it's quite inc- like it's incredible you just see lorries and cars you can't see any historic buildings and it's part of this heritage action zone which is looking and making a place more inclusive and you know, we've said, why don't we do some direct action? And so, of course, we did so much direct action with Dip 10, you know, let's take up some car parking spaces and let's make something happen and just do it and test it. Let's not, you know, let's engage through doing. Um, what if we start to change the way of spaces and then try and, you know, feedback, like see how that works. And so actually, I think we did it. What was great about the AA is just, I think it just allows you to test a lot, like really think about what you're doing. Um, I think as a, as a unit, Diptem was always slightly different from every other unit anyway, and they're always trying to test different models and structures. And I feel as if I'm coming back, slightly coming back. I think I definitely went, you know, different routes, but it's a, yeah, it, it's always in the back of my mind, actually, managing. It was a, definitely a good, like, it definitely set my foundation <laughs> to move forward. Yeah, well, maybe looking back to look forward, but um, yeah, I guess I'm conscious of time and I actually I could ask you questions for the rest of the night and um, you probably want to have dinner, but um, it was so lovely to have you here, Stephanie, and thank you so much for such an incredible lecture, but also for being um, so open and and honest in the answers to the many questions. I think this is the most engaged audience we've had um, so far in the series with the number of questions that you've received, So, um, which I think is testament to what a fascinating practice and space you've carved out for um, user-focused design. And I hope more people follow in your footsteps. Oh, thank you, Anna <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to try and do a, a, a quick mass unmute so that people can actually give you a round of applause. So one second. It's better than emoji applause. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. So lovely. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye all.